and my dear brothers and sisters, I welcome all of you with the greetings used by Jesus, peace be upon him, which is mentioned in the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 24, verse number 36. In Hebrew, he said, Shalom Alaikum. And in Arabic, we Muslims say, Assalamu Alaikum. May peace be on all of you. The topic of this evening's talk is similarities between Islam and Christianity. Islam comes from the root word salam, which means peace. It's also derived from the Arabic word silm, which means to submit your will to Almighty God. In short, Islam means peace acquired by submitting our will to Almighty God. And anyone who submits his will to Almighty God, he is called as a Muslim. People have a misconception that Islam is a new religion which came into existence 1400 years ago. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the founder of this religion. In fact, Islam is there since time immemorial, since man set foot on this earth. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is not the founder of this religion, but he is the last and final messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God. It is mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Fatir, chapter number 35, verse number 24. Wa min illa nazir. There is not a nation or a tribe to whom we have not sent a warn or a guide. It's mentioned in Surah Rad, chapter number 13, verse number 7. Walikulli in had. And to every nation have we sent a guide. By name, there are 25 messengers mentioned in the glorious Quran. For example, Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon them all. By name, 25 messengers are mentioned in the Quran. Islam is the only non-Christian faith which makes it an article of faith to believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. We believe that he was one of the mightiest messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God. We believe that he was the Christ translated as Masih. We believe that he was born miraculously without any male intervention, which many modern day Christians today do not believe. We believe that he gave life to the dead with God's permission. We believe that he healed those born blind and lepers with God's permission. By name, there are 25 messengers given in the glorious Quran. But it's also mentioned in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 164, and Surah Ghafir, chapter number 40, verse number 78, that we narrate to you the stories of some of the messengers, of the others we don't. That means the story of only some of the messengers are mentioned in the glorious Quran. A beloved Prophet Muhammad said, that there were 124,000 messengers sent on the face of the earth. But all the messengers that came before the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, they were only sent for their people. And the message which they proclaimed was supposed to be followed in totality only for a particular time period. For example, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. He was sent only for the Bani Israel, only for the Jews. It's mentioned in the glorious Quran. In Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 49, that we appointed Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, as a messenger to the Bani Israel, to the children of Israel. It's mentioned in Surah Saf, chapter number 61, verse number 6, that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was sent as a messenger to the children of Israel. The same message is given in the Bible. If you read the Bible, it's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 10, verse number 5 and 6. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he tells his apostles 
that go in not into the way of the Gentiles. Who are the Gentiles? The non-Jews. Go in not into the way of the Gentiles. Enter in not into the city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, further says, it's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 15, verse number 24. I have not been sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was sent as a messenger only to the Bani Israel, only to the Jews, only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But since Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was the last and final messenger, it's mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Azab, chapter number 33, verse number 40. Ma kana Muhammadun aba ahadim mirjalikum walakhi Rasulullah wa khatam al nabin wa kana Allah bi kulli shayin alima. Which means, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is not the father of any of you men, but he is the messenger of Allah. And he is the seal of the prophets. And Allah is all knowing, full of knowledge. Since Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was the last and final messenger. He was not sent only for the Muslims or only for the Arabs. It's mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 107. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةَ الْعَالَمِينَ That we have sent thee not but as a mercy to all the worlds, as a mercy to all the creatures, as a mercy to the whole of humanity. It's repeated in the Quran, in Surah Sabah, chapter number 34, verse number 28. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا كَافَّةً لِلنَّاسِ بَشِيرًا وَنَزِيرًا That we have sent thee not but as a universal messenger, giving glad tidings and warning them against sin. But most of the human beings yet do not know. Since Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was the last and final messenger, he was not sent only for the Muslims or for the Arabs, he was sent for the whole of humanity. And the prophecy of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is mentioned in the scriptures of all the major world religions. It's even mentioned in the Bible. If you read the Old Testament, it's mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 18, verse number 18, Almighty God says, I shall raise them, O prophet, from among thy brethren, like unto thee, and I shall put my words into his mouth, and he shall speak all that I command him. This prophecy, which is mentioned in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 18, verse number 18, Almighty God speaks to Moses, peace be upon him, and says, I shall raise them, O prophet, from among thy brethren, like unto thee, and I shall put my words into his mouth, and he shall speak all that I command him. Many of the Christians, they say that this prophecy refers to Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. And when we ask them that how does this prophecy refer to Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, and they tell us that here the prophecy says, I shall raise them for prophet from among their brethren like unto thee. The prophet to come should be like Moses, peace be upon him. And the similarities the Christians give between Jesus and Moses, peace be upon them, is that Prophet Jesus and Prophet Moses, peace be upon them, both of them, they were Jews. And both Prophet Jesus and Prophet Moses, peace be upon them, both of them were prophets of God. If these two are the only similarities for the fulfillment of the prophecy, then all the prophets mentioned in the Bible after Moses, peace be upon him, fulfilled the prophecy. All the prophets mentioned after Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, were Jews and all were prophets of God. For example, Prophet Solomon, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Daniel, Joel, John the Baptist, all of them, they were Jews and all of them were prophets of God. If these two are the only similarities, then there are several prophets mentioned in the Bible which fulfill this prophecy. In fact, if we analyze this prophecy does not befit anyone better than the last and final messenger prophet muhammad peace be upon him if we analyze prophet moses 
and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon them. Both of them were born naturally. They had a mother and they had a father. But Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he was born miraculously without any male intervention. He had a mother, but he had no father. And it is mentioned in the Quran about his birth in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 47. It's also mentioned in the Bible in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 1, verse number 18, and the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 1, verse number 35, that he was born miraculously without any male intervention. So if we analyze, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is like Prophet Moses, peace be upon him. And Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, is unlike Prophet Moses, peace be upon him. Furthermore, we know that Prophet Muhammad and Prophet Moses, peace be upon them, both of them, they were married and they had children. But according to the Bible, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he was not married and he had no children. So Muhammad, peace be upon him, is like Moses, peace be upon him, and Jesus, peace be upon him, is unlike Moses, peace be upon him. Further, when we read the Quran and the Bible, we come to know that Moses, peace be upon him, he had a natural death. Same like Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He too had a natural death. But Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he did not have a natural death. According to the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 158, he was raised up alive. And according to the Bible also, it is the same. But many Christians say that he was crucified. Even if we agree what they say, though I've given a talk proving from the Bible that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was not crucified, irrespective whether he was raised up alive or whether he was crucified, he did not die a natural death. So if we analyze, we come to know that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is like Moses, peace be upon him. And Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, is unlike Moses, peace be upon him. Further, we come to know from the Quran and the Bible that Prophet Moses and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon them, both of them were accepted by the people as a whole. But Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he was not accepted by the people as a whole. It's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 1, verse number 11. He came to his own and his own people forsook him. So he was not accepted by his people as a whole. Furthermore, Moses and Muhammad, peace be upon them, they were worldly kings. That means they could give the punishment of life and death to whoever they wanted. They had that power. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. It's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 18, verse number 36. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. And furthermore, Moses and Muhammad, peace be upon them, both of them, they bought a new law. But Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he did not bring a new law. He came to confirm the previous law. As what is mentioned clearly in the Quran, in Surah Saf, chapter number 61, verse number 6, that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, the son of Mary, he said to the children of Israel, Ya Bani Israel, O children of Israel, I have been sent as a messenger to you, confirming the law what has come before me and giving glad tidings of a messenger to come whose name shall be Ahmad, which is another name of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. It's also mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 157. It says, they follow the messenger. The unlettered prophet, which is mentioned in the scriptures, the law and the gospel. So when we read the Quran, it says that it will be prophesied in the scriptures, in the law and the gospel about the coming of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has been prophesied in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 18, verse number 18. And further it's mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 18, verse number 19, that anyone who does not hearken to his words, I will require of him. Some translations say, I will take revenge. That means anyone who does not follow this messenger to come, Almighty God will take revenge from these people. It's further mentioned in the Old Testament, 
in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 29, verse number 12, it says, The book will be given to him who is not learned, and it will be said, Pray, read this, and he will say, I am not learned. And this is exactly what happened when the first revelation came to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we know from history that when Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, went to Jabal Nur, Gare Hira, there when the first revelation was brought by Archangel Gabriel, and he said, Ikra, our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ma Anabi Khari, I am not learned. This is exactly the fulfillment of the prophecy mentioned in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 29, verse number 12, that when the book will be given to him who is not learned, and it will be said, pray, read this, he will say, I am not learned. And this is exactly what Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ma Ana Bikhari, I am not learned. Even the name of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is mentioned in the Old Testament. It's mentioned in the book of Solomon, chapter number 5, verse number 16. It's a Hebrew quotation which says, The translation which means that his mouth is more sweet. He is altogether lovely. He is my beloved. He is my friend. O daughter of Jerusalem. But the Hebrew quotation is, In Semitic languages, Normally, usually, im is added as a respect. So to the name Muhammad is added Muhammadim, im, so it becomes Muhammadim. So he is mentioned by name in the original manuscript, but they translate the proper noun to altogether lovely. So when you read the translation of the Bible, you don't realize that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his name is mentioned in the Bible. Time doesn't permit us to go into all the details of the prophecies. But Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is even mentioned in the New Testament. It's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 16. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says that I will pray to my Father, I'll pray to Almighty God, to send you a comforter. It's further mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 15, verse number 26. And when I pray to my father, and when he sends you a comforter, he will abide with you forever. It's further mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter shall not come. For if I depart, shall I send him. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says that nevertheless, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter shall not come. For if I depart, shall I send him? Now this comforter, if we analyze, in the original script, in the language Aramaic, it is paraclete, which means the praiseworthy, which is the translation of the name Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But they have converted it into parakletos, which one of its meanings is a comforter, irrespective whether it's paraclete or paracletos, alhamdulillah, both these meanings befit the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But many Christians say that this prophecy about the comforter to come refers to the Holy Spirit. Now, if we analyze the prophecy clearly mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter shall not come. The criteria for the comforter to come is that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, should go. If he goes, the comforter shall come. Only after he departs will he send him. So the major criteria for the comforter to come is after Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, departs. From the Bible, we know that the Holy Spirit was already there before Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. He was there in the womb of Elizabeth. He was there when Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was born. He was there in the Feast of Pentecost. So surely, this prophecy cannot refer to the Holy Spirit. It refers to no one but the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. It's further mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, 
verse number 12 to 14. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says, I have many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. For he, when the spirit of truth shall come, he shall guide you unto all truth. He shall not speak of himself. All that he hear shall he speak. He shall show you things to come. He shall glorify me. This prophecy again refers to no one but the last and final messenger prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It says, I have many things to say unto you. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is saying, I have many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. For he, when the spirit of truth shall come, he shall guide you unto all truth. He shall not speak of himself. All that he hear, shall he say. He shall guide you to the truth. He shall show you things to come. He shall glorify me. And this prophecy does not refer to anyone but the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I have given a separate talk only on the prophecy of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Bible, which you can speak for us together only on this topic. It's further mentioned in the glorious Quran, in Surah Rod, chapter number 13, verse number 38. It says, Likulli ajlin kitab. In every age have we sent a book, have we sent a revelation. By name, there are four revelations mentioned in the Quran. Torah, Zabur, Injil, and the Quran. Torah is the wahi, the revelation, which was given to Moses, peace be upon him. Zabur is the wahi, the revelation, which was given to Prophet David, peace be upon him. Injil is the wahi, the revelation, which was given to Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him. And Quran is the last and final revelation, which was given to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. By name, only four revelations are mentioned in the glorious Quran. But in every age, Almighty God has sent a revelation. There are several other revelations, for example, Sufi, Ibrahim, etc. But by name, only four are mentioned. All the revelations that were revealed before the last and final revelation, the glorious Quran, they were meant only for a particular group of people. And the message which was sent was meant to be followed in totality only for a particular time period. But since Quran was the last and final revelation, it was not meant only for the Muslims or for the Arabs. It's mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse number 1. Alif Lam Ra. This is the book we have revealed to thee, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, so that thou may leadest the mankind from the depths of darkness to light. It says, so that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, will lead the whole of mankind, not only the Muslims or the Arabs, from the depths of darkness to light. It's mentioned in Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse number 52. Here is a message for mankind. Let them take warning therefrom. Let them know there is one God. Let the men of understanding take heed. It's mentioned in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 185. Ramadan was the month in which the Quran was revealed as a guidance to the whole of humankind, as a criteria to judge right from wrong. It's mentioned in Surah Az-Zumur, chapter 39, verse number 41. We have revealed to thee, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the book to instruct the humankind. It doesn't say to instruct only the Muslims or the Arabs, but to instruct the whole of humankind. Since Quran is the last and final revelation, it was not meant only for the Muslims or the Arabs, it was meant for the whole of humankind. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, in the book of Iman, hadith number eight, our beloved Prophet said, that the religion of Islam is based on five principles, on five pillars. The first is, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. The second is, establishing Salah. The third, is zakat. The fourth is psalm and the fifth is hajj. The first pillar is la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. There's no God but Allah and Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him is the messenger of Allah. It's mentioned in the Quran in Surah Baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 177. It is not righteousness that you turn your face to the east or west but it is righteousness that you believe in Allah. You believe in Almighty God. You believe in the last day. You believe in his angels, in his books, and his messengers. I started my talk 
by quoting a verse from the glorious Quran from Surah Al Imran, chapter number three, verse number 64, which says, Kul, Ya Hilal Kitab. Say, O people of the book, Ta'alo ila kalmatin sawa im banana bainakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah, na'buda illallah. That we worship none but one Almighty God. That we associate no partners with Him. That we erect not among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah. Find tawallah. If then they turn back. Fakulu shadu. Say, e bear witness. We are not Muslimun. That we are Muslims bowing our will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This verse of the glorious Quran shows us a way how to speak with different types of people, especially the Ahl Kitab. It says, Talo ila kalmitin sawa im bainara bainakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah, na'buda illallah. That we worship none but one Almighty God. Wala nushrika bihi shayyam. That we associate no partners with Him. Wala yatta khizabad dunabad dan arbaban min dunillah. That we erect not among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah. We have to come to the common terms, to the similarities which are mentioned in the Bible and the Quran. It's clearly mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Ikhlas, chapter number 112, verse number 1 to 4. It says, Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Say, He is Allah one and only. Allah samad. Allah. The absolute and eternal. Lam yalid, walam yulad. He begets not, nor is he begotten. Walam yakullahu kufwan ad. There's nothing like him. This is a four line definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God, given in the glorious Quran. If any person says so and so candidate is God, if that candidate fits in this four line definition of Surah Ikhlas, we Muslims have got no objection in accepting. That candidate as God. The first is, Kul huwa Allahu ahad. Say, He is Allah one and only. Second, Allahu samad. Allah, the absolute and eternal. Lam yalid, walam yulad. He begets not, nor is he begotten. Walam yakullahu kufwan ahad. There is nothing like him. This four line definition of Surah Ikhlas is called as the touchstone of theology. Theo means God, logi means study. Theology means the study of God. Surah Ikhlas is the touchstone of theology. Any person is saying that so and so candidate is God. Any person is worshipping any God. Put that God to the test of Surah Ikhlas. If he passes this four line definition of Surah Ikhlas, we Muslims have got no objection in accepting that candidate as God. The similar message is given in the Bible. It's mentioned in the Bible in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number six, verse number four. Moses, peace be upon him, says, Shama Israelo, adna al-hayno adna ikhad. It's a Hebrew quotation which means, Yoro Israel, the Lord, our God, is one God. And when Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was asked, which is the first of the commandments, he repeated verbatim what was mentioned by Moses, peace be upon him. It's mentioned in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 12. Verse number 29, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says, Shama Israelo, adnai khaynu adnai khad. Yoro Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. It's further mentioned in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 48, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God, will never forgive the sin of associating partners with God. Any other sin, if he pleases, he may forgive. But anyone who has associated partners with God, he has done the most heinous sin. The same message repeated in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 116. That Almighty God, He will never forgive the sin of joining other gods with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any other sin, if He pleases, He may forgive. But anyone who has joined other gods with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has strayed away very far. So the biggest sin in Islam is associating partners with Almighty God, joining other gods with Allah, the Almighty God. And the same message is given in the Bible, in the book of Exodus, chapter number 20, verse number 3 to 5. It's mentioned that Almighty God says, Thou shall have 
no other god besides me thou shall not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything in the heavens above in the earth beneath and the water under the earth thou shall not bow down to them nor serve them for i thy god thy lord is a jealous god the same message is repeated in the book of deuteronomy chapter number 5 verse number 7 to 9 almighty god says thou shall have none other gods besides me thou shall not make unto thee any graven image of anything or any likeness in the heavens above in the earth beneath or in the water beneath the earth thou shall not bow down to them nor serve them for i thy god thy lord is a jealous god it's clearly mentioned in the quran in surah maida chapter number 5 verse number 72 laqad kafara allazina qalu inna allah huwa almasih ibn maryam they are blaspheming they are doing kufr those who say that allah is jesus the son of mary the quran says they are blaspheming they are doing kufr those who say that god is jesus the son of mary wa qala almasih but said christ ya bani israil o children of israel u'budullah worship allah rabbi wa rabbakum who is my lord and your lord inna mushrik billah anyone who associates partners with allah faqad harrama allah lil jannah allah will make jannah haram for him wama wa hunnar wama lil zalimin min ansar and fire shall be his dwelling place and he shall have no help in the hereafter jesus christ peace be upon him said inna mushrik billah anyone who associates partners with almighty god faqad harrama allah lil jannah allah will make paradise forbidden for him wama wa hunnar wama lil zalimin min ansar and fire shall be his dwelling place and he shall have no helpers in the hereafter the biggest sin in islam as well as christianity is to associate partners with god but unfortunately there are many of our christian brothers and sisters who say that jesus christ peace be upon him he claimed divinity in fact if you read the bible there is not a single unequivocal statement in the complete bible where jesus christ peace be upon him himself says that i am god or where he says worship me i would like to repeat my statement that if you read the bible there is not a single unequivocal statement not a single unambiguous statement in the complete bible where jesus christ peace be upon him himself says that i am god or where he says worship me in fact if you read the bible jesus christ peace be upon him said it's mentioned in the gospel of john chapter number 14 verse number 28 jesus christ peace be upon him said my father is greater than i gospel of john chapter number 10 verse number 29 my father is greater than all gospel of matthew chapter number 12 verse number 28 I cast out devils with the spirit of God. Gospel of Luke chapter number 11 verse number 20. I with the finger of God cast out devils. Gospel of John chapter number 5 verse number 30. I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge and my judgment is just for I seek not my will but the will of my father. Anyone who says I seek not my will but the will of almighty God, he is a Muslim. Jesus Christ peace be upon him said, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. For I seek not of my will, but the will of Almighty God. Anyone who says that I submit my will to the will of Almighty God in Arabic, we call him as a Muslim. Muslim means submitting your will to Almighty God, as I mentioned initially. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was a Muslim. It's mentioned in the Book of Acts, chapter number two, verse number twenty-two. It says. ye men of israel listen to this jesus of nazareth a man approved of god amongst you by miracles and wonders and signs which god did by him and you are witness to it it says jesus of nazareth a man approved of god amongst you by miracles and wonders and signs which god did by him and you are witness to it jesus christ peace be upon him he never claimed divinity he was one of the mightiest messengers of allah subhanahu wa taala of almighty god it's mentioned in the quran in surah isra chapter number 17 verse number 110 kulidullah abdurrahman ayamatadu falal asmaul husna seek all upon him by allah 
or by Rahman. By whichever name you call upon him, to him belong the most beautiful name. You can call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by any name, but it should be a beautiful name. It should be a name given by Allah and his messenger. It should not conjure up a mental picture. And there are no less than 99 different attributes given to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this message that to him belongs the most beautiful name. Besides Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse 110, it's also mentioned in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 8. In Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 180, as well as Surah Hashar, chapter number 59, verse number 24, that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala belong the most beautiful names. And if we read the Quran, there are no less than 99 different attributes given to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Al-Hakim, most merciful, most gracious, most wise, no less than 99. And the crowning one, it is Allah. Why do we Muslims prefer calling Allah by the Arabic name Allah instead of the English word God? The reason is because a person can play mischief with the English word God. For example, if you add S to God, it becomes God's. That's plural of God. There is nothing like plural Allah. Kul hu Allah ahad. Say he is Allah one and only. If you add P-E-S-S -E -S to God, it becomes goddess. That means a female God. There is nothing like male Allah or female Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has got no gender. If you add a father to God, it becomes Godfather. He's my Godfather. He's my guardian. There's nothing like Allah Father or Allah Abba in Islam. If you add a mother to God, it becomes Godmother. There's nothing like Allah Mother or Allah Ammi in Islam. Allah is a unique word. If you prefix a tin before God, it becomes tin God. There's nothing like tin Allah in Islam. That's the reason we Muslims, we prefer calling Allah by the Arabic word Allah instead of the English word God. And this word Allah, I being a student of comparative religion, this word Allah is mentioned in the scriptures of the major world religions. And it's also mentioned in the Bible. If you read the Bible, it's mentioned in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 15, verse number 34, as well as Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 27, verse number 46. When Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, when he was put on the cross, he cries out, Allah, Allah, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In every Bible, any translation you pick up, any language, whether it be English Bible, Hindi Bible, Tagalog Bible, French Bible, German Bible, any Bible you pick up, this word, Allah, Allah, lama sabachthani, has been maintained in its pure form. Why? Allah knows the best. Why have these original words have been maintained? And then the translation says, My God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? But the original, Allah, Allah, Lama Sabakhtani, has been maintained for reasons best known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all the Bibles. You pick up any version of the Bible. King James Version, RSV Version, New American Standard Version, New World Translation, any version out of the hundreds available, any language of the Bible, this verse, Allah, Allah, Lama Sabakhtani, has been maintained. And the translation, if it's English Bible, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? Now, if you want to try it out, that people say, but natural, Allah, Allah, Lama Sabakhtani, does not sound similar to my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? Does it sound similar to Jehovah, Jehovah, why has thou forsaken me? And the answer is no. Now, if you translate this verse into Arabic, Allah, Allah, lama sabakhtani, it will read Allah, Allah, lama taraktani. Hebrew and Arabic, they're Semitic languages. Allah, Allah, lama sabakhtani, Allah, Allah, lama taraktani. This sounds similar. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, too, used the same word Allah, Almighty God. And this word Allah, I being a student of comparative religion, is mentioned in the scriptures of the major world religions. That's the reason we Muslims, we prefer calling Allah, by the Arabic word Allah, instead of the English word God. The second pillar of Islam, it is Salah. 
and normally people translate salah into english as prayers to pray means to beseech to ask for help i personally don't think that prayer is the correct translation of the arabic word salah because to pray means to beseech to ask for help in our salah besides asking for help from almighty god we are also praising him at the same time we are getting benefit from allah subhanahu wa taala from almighty god we are getting guidance that's the reason i personally prefer calling prayers as a sort of programming towards righteousness for example if after surah fatiha the imam he may recite surah maida chapter number 5 verse number 90 which says ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu o you believe in the mal khamru wal maisru most certainly intoxicants and gambling wal anzab wal azlamu dedication of stones divination of arrows rishu min amli shaitan these are satan's handiwork fast and ibul lakum tuflihun abstain from this handiwork that may prosper here we are being programmed we are being guided by allah subhanahu wa taala that alcohol is prohibited gambling is prohibited fortune telling is prohibited idol worship is prohibited we are being programmed towards righteousness and allah says in the quran in surah ankabut chapter number 29 verse number 45 utlu ma uya ilayka min alkitabi wa qimus salata inna salata tanha anil fasha al munkar the recite of what we have revealed to thee by inspiration and establish regular prayers for verily prayers restrains you from shameful and unjust deeds the quran says that prayer restrains you from shameful and unjust deeds therefore i prefer calling salah rather than prayers as programming towards righteousness or in layman's terminology it's called as brainwashing but normally when you hear the adhan and somebody asks where are you going and if you say i'm going for brainwashing it sounds a bit odd so i've got no objection if someone uses the english word prayer for the arabic word salah but i like to remind them it is not the proper translation similarly when i say that allah is the correct word god is not the proper translation but if someone uses god for allah when they are speaking to non muslims like what i'm doing today when i use the word god for allah i have got no objection but i like to remind them that god is not the appropriate translation of the arabic word allah similarly prayer is not the appropriate translation of the arabic word salah and we muslims have to offer salah minimum 5 times a day it's mentioned in the quran in surah isra chapter number 17 verse number 78 and surah taha chapter number 20 verse number 130 that we have to offer salah 5 times a day like how for a healthy body the doctors they tell us we should have three meals a day similarly for a spiritual soul we should offer salah five times a day and the quran says in surah maida chapter number 5 verse number 6 oh you believe when you prepare yourself for salah wash your face and your hands and arms up to the elbow and rub your head with water and wash your feet up to the ankles ablution wudu is one of the prerequisites before salah wudu is fard the same message is even given in the bible if you read the bible it is mentioned in the book of exodus chapter number 40 verse number 31 and 32 that moses and aaron and their sons they washed their hands and feet thereat and when they went to the temple and when they approached the altar of god they washed as was commanded by almighty god the same message is repeated in the book of acts chapter number 21 verse number 26 it says that paul along with his men he washed before he appeared in front of the lord and previously it was mentioned in the book of exodus chapter number 40 verse number 31 and verse number 32 that moses and aaron and his sons they washed before they appeared in front of the lord so wudu is compulsory in islam as well as in christianity ablution further it's mentioned in the quran in surah taha chapter number 20 verse number 11 and 12 when moses approached the fire he heard a voice oh moses i am your lord so in my presence remove thy 
footwear. For thou art in the sacred valley of Tuwa. Removing the footwear for Salah was a commandment given by Almighty God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to Moses, peace be upon him. This message is also repeated in the book of Exodus, chapter number 3, verse number 5. It says, Almighty God says to Moses, Do not na hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for thou art on the sacred grounds. The same message is repeated in the book of Acts, chapter number 7, verse number 33. Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for thou art on sacred grounds. So because it was a commandment of Almighty God to Moses, we remove our footwear before offering salah. But it's also mentioned in the hadith of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa in Abu Dawood, volume number one, book of Salah, chapter number 240, hadith number 653. Shweb, may Allah be pleased with him, he said on the authority of his father, that his grandfather said, he saw Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, pray with his footwear as well as without his footwear. So we Muslims, we can offer Salah with our footwear as well as without our footwear. But when we offer with our footwear, we have to see to it that we clean the souls. Furthermore, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, worm number one, in the book of Adan, chapter number 75, hadith number 692, Hadith Anas, may Allah be pleased with him. He said that when we offer salah, our shoulders touch the shoulder of the companion. It's mentioned in Abu Dawood, worm number one, in the book of Salah, chapter number 245. Hadith number 666, Abdullah ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, he said that the Prophet before starting Salah, he turned around and said, that straight in your rows, stand shoulder to shoulder, close in the gaps, and do not leave any opening for the devil. The Prophet was not referring to the devil, which you see in the museum with two horns and a tail. He was referring to the devil of racism, of caste, of color, of wealth irrespective whether you're rich or poor, king or pauper, when you stand for salah, you stand shoulder to shoulder. Irrespective whether black or white, yellow or brown, when you stand for salah, you stand shoulder to shoulder. And the best part of salah is the sujood. It is the prostration. In the Quran, sujood is mentioned no less than 90 times. And Allah says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 43, that, O oh Mary, worship thy loud devotee and prostrate thyself and bow down with those who bow down. Allah repeats the message in Surah Hajj, chapter number 22, verse number 77. That, Ya Amanu, O you believe, bow down and prostrate yourselves and worship thy loud and do good things so that you may prosper. All the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God, when they offered salah, when they prayed to Almighty God, they did the sujood. They prostrated. And if you read the Bible, it's mentioned in the book of Genesis, chapter number 17, verse number 3. Abraham fell on his face when he prayed to the Lord. It's mentioned in the book of Numbers, chapter number 20, verse number 6, that Moses and Aaron fell upon the face and the Lord appeared to them. It's mentioned in the book of Joshua, chapter number 5, verse number 14, that Joshua fell on his face and he prayed to God. It's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, Chapter number 26, verse number 39. In the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he fell on his face and he prayed to God. So all the prophets of God, they fell on their face and they prayed to God. And no gymnast also can do better than the way we Muslims do. By falling on the face and praying to God, that means we put the highest part of our body, the forehead, on the lowest part on the ground, and we say, Sumana bin Allah, that glory be to Allah, who's the most high. And today the psychology they tell us that the mind is not directly under our control, but our body is directly under our control. If I want to raise my hand, I can raise my hand. I can take a step forward. But the mind is not directly under our control. Therefore, to humble your mind, you have to humble your body. And there's no better way than to put the highest part of your body, the forehead, the lowest part on the ground, and then say, glory be to Allah the Most High. Glory be to Allah the Most High, thrice. The third pillar of Islam is zakah. Zakah means to purify. It means growth. And in Islam, every rich person 
who has a saving of more than the nisab level, more than 85 grams of gold, he or she should give 2.5% of that saving every lunar year in charity. If every rich human being gives zakat, poverty will eradicate from this world. There will not be a single human being who will die of hunger. As mentioned in the Quran in Surah Al-Hashar, chapter 59, verse number 7, that zakat had been prescribed so that it prevents the wealth from circulating amongst the rich. Zakat, obligatory charity, has been prescribed so that it prevents the wealth from circulating only amongst the rich. And the same guidance is given in 1 Peter, chapter number 4, verse number 8, that give fervent charity, for charity covers up multitude of sins. The fourth pillar of Islam, it is Som, that is fasting. Every adult Muslim who is healthy, he should fast, that is abstain from food, drink and sex, from dawn to sunset, for one full lunar month, that is the month of Ramadan. This is called as Som, as fasting. And it's mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 183, that fasting has been prescribed to you as it was prescribed to people who came before you, so that you may learn self-restraint. The main reason for fasting, according to the Quran, is for self-restraint, is for self-control. And today the psychology, they tell us that if you can control your hunger, you can control almost all your desires. And there are various benefits of fasting, medical benefits, other benefits. You can give a talk only on benefits of fasting. For example, today medical science tells us that if you fast the way Islam prescribes for one full lunar month, it increases the intestinal absorption. It even reduces the cholesterol level. If you can abstain from smoking from dawn to dusk, very well, you can abstain from smoking from the cradle to the grave. If you can abstain from drinking alcohol from dawn to dusk, very well, you can abstain from drinking alcohol from the cradle to the grave. It gives us an opportunity to inculcate in us the habits which are good and abstain from those habits which are wrong. Fasting is also prescribed in the Bible, in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 9, verse number 29, as well as the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 17, verse number 21. Even the Bible prescribes fasting. The fifth pillar of Islam is Hajj. Every adult Muslim who has the means to perform Hajj should perform Hajj, that is the pilgrimage to the holy city of Makkah in the month of Hajj, at least once in his lifetime. Hajj is the biggest annual gathering of the world. About two and a half million people gather from different parts of the world. From America, from UK, from Canada, from India, from Pakistan, from UAE, from Malaysia, from Indonesia. Two and a half million people gather from different parts of the world. And they're dressed up in two pieces of unsewn cloth, preferably white. The men, they're dressed up in two pieces of unsewn cloth, preferably white. You cannot identify the person standing next to you, whether he's a king or a pauper. It is the best example of international brotherhood. The Quran says in Surah Hujurat, chapter number 49, verse number 13, Ya ayyuhan nasu inna khalaqnaakum min zakrin wa unsa wa ja'alnaakum shu'ubam wa qaba'ila li ta'rafu inna karmukum inda Allah yatkaakum inna Allah alimun kabeer O humankind, we have created you from a single pair of male and female and have divided you into nations and tribes so that you shall recognize each other not that you shall despise each other and the most honored in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the person who has taqwa the criteria for judgment in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is not wealth, it is not color, it is not sex, it is not age, but it is taqwa, it is righteousness, it is God consciousness, it is piety. And if you read the Bible, it's mentioned in the Bible, in the book of Psalms, chapter number 84, verse number 4 to 7, it says, Blessed are those people who travel to the valley of Bakka. Bakka is another name for Makkah. It's also mentioned in the Quran, 
in Surah Al Imran, chapter number three, verse number 96, that Bakka is the first place of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Bakka is another name for Makkah. And it is also mentioned in the Bible that blessed are those people who travel to Makkah. This was in brief regarding the five pillars of Islam. But these five pillars are only the pillars, they aren't the complete structure. But if the pillars are strong, inshallah, God willing, even the structure will be strong. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Dariyat, chapter number 51, verse number 56, that we have created the jinn and the men not but to worship me. The main reason for our creation is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The word ibadah comes from the word abd. That means we have to serve. We have to be obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if we obey the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are submitting our will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, the glorious Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 90. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, O you who believe, inna mal khamru wal maithru, most certainly intoxicants and gambling, wal anzab wal azlamu, dedication of stones, divination of arrows, rich to minamali shaitan, these are Satan's handiwork. First anibunu lukum tuflihun, abstain from this handiwork that you may prosper. So if you abstain from having intoxicants, you are doing ibadah. You are worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are obeying his commandments. You are submitting our will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the same message is given in the Bible. If you read the book of Proverbs, chapter number 20, verse number 1, it says, Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. And whoever is deceived is not wise. A similar message is repeated in the book of Ephesians, chapter number 5. Verse number 18, it says, be not drunk with wine. So alcohol is even prohibited in the Bible in no less than two different places. So if you abstain from having alcohol, you are submitting a will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the Quran, in no less than four different places. In Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, verse number 173. In Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 3. In Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 145. And Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 115. Hurrimat alaykumul maitu tu waddamu wa lahamul khinzir. Wa ma ahullali gairin labi. Forbidden for you for food, ah? Dead meat, blood, the flesh of swine, and any food on which any name besides Allah's name is taken. So these four foods, dead meat, blood, the flesh of swine that is pork, and any food on which any name besides Allah's name is taken, it is prohibited in the Quran in no less than four different places. These types of food are even prohibited in the Bible. If you read the Bible, in the book of Leviticus, chapter number 17, verse number 15, and the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 14, verse number 21, it says, you shall not eat anything which dieth of itself. So even dead meat is prohibited in the Bible. Regarding blood, there are no less than five different places in the Bible where blood is prohibited. If you read in the book of Genesis, chapter number 9, verse number 4. In the book of Leviticus, chapter number 17, verse number 14. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 12, verse number 16. In 1 Samuel, chapter number 14, verse number 33. And the book of Acts, chapter number 15, verse number 29. The Bible prohibits having blood in no less than five different places. As far as the pork is concerned, it's mentioned in the Bible, in the book of Leviticus, chapter number 11, verse number 7 and 8, that the swine, though it divides the hoof and is cloven-footed, yet it chews not the cud. It's unclean for you. Thou shalt not eat its flesh, nor touch its carcass. It is unclean for you. The same message is repeated in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 14, verse number 8. The swine, Though it divides the hoof, yet it chews not the cud. It's unclean for you. Thou shalt not eat its flesh, nor touch its carcass. And eating pork has been prohibited the third time in the Bible, in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 65, verse number 2 to 5. The Bible prohibits the eating of the flesh of swine, that is pork, in no less than three different places. And the last, the eating food on which any name besides Allah's name that has been taken, is also prohibited in the Bible. In the book of Acts, 
chapter number 15, verse number 29, as well as the book of Revelation, chapter number 2, verse number 14, that any food on which any name besides Almighty God's name is taken, if that food is put on altars, then that food is prohibited even for the Christians. If Christian means following the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, I would like to say that we Muslims are more Christian than the Christians themselves. <laughs> Further, if you read the Quran, the Quran gives us various guidance. Quran says that we have to be honest. It's mentioned in the Quran, you have to love your neighbors. Allah says in Surah Ma'un, chapter number 107, verse number 1 to 7, Araita lazi yukazibu biddin, fazalika lazi yadu ul yatim, walai huddu ala tahumil miskin, fawai lul lil musalleen, Allah zinam salatim sahun, Allah zinam yura'un wa yamnaun al ma'un. Seest thou not the one who denies the judgment to come, who treats the orphan with harshness, and feeds not the indigent? Woe to those who are neglectful of the prayers. Woe to those who only pray to be seen of men and they do not even provide neighborly needs. So to provide neighborly need is submitting our will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that he is not a Muslim who sleeps with his full stomach when his neighbor is hungry. And a person asked, who is the neighbor? The Prophet said, 40 houses next to you is your neighbor. Backbiting is prohibited in the Quran. The Quran says in Surah Humaza, chapter number 104, verse number 1, Why lulli kulli humazatil lumaza? Woe to every kind of scandal monger and backbiter. If you abstain from backbiting, you are submitting a will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran says that you have to love and respect and be kind to your parents. Allah says in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 23 and 24, that we have enjoined on the human beings that you worship none but me and that you be kind to your parents. And if any one of them or both of them reach old age, don't say a word of contempt. Don't say oof to them, nor repel them, but address them with honor and lower to them your wing of humility and pray to the God that have mercy on them as they cherish me in childhood. The Quran says if any one of your parents or both of them reach old age, you can't even say oof to them but address them with honor and lower your wing of humility and pray to the Lord that bless them as they cherish me in childhood. So if you love your parents, if you respect your parents, if you are kind to your parents, you are submitting a will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are submitting a will to Almighty God. Monasticism is prohibited in Islam. Our beloved Prophet said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, poem number seven, in the book of Nikah, chapter number three, hadith number four, the Prophet said, O oh, young people, Whoever has the means to get married, he should get married. The Prophet said, whoever does not marry is not of me. So if you marry, you are submitting a will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 19, that treat your wife with the footing of equity and kindness, even if you dislike her. The Quran says you have to love and be kind to your wife, even if you dislike her. You have to be just to her. So if you love your wife, you are submitting a will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are submitting a will to Almighty God. The Quran says in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 32, that come not close to adultery, for it is an evil opening other roads to evil. So if you abstain from adultery, you are submitting a will to Almighty God. In Islam, we have a system of modesty, which is the same in Christianity. Quran says in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, Verse number 30. Say to the believing man that he should lower his gaze and guard his modesty. Whenever a man looks at any woman and if any brazen thought, any unashamed thought comes in his mind, he should lower his gaze. The same message is given in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 5, verse number 27 and 28, where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says, It has been said of the old times that thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say unto you, Whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery in his heart. The same as the Quran says that lower your gaze, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says that anyone who looketh upon a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery in his heart. The next verse, Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 31 says, Say to the believing woman that she should lower her gaze and guard her modesty. 
and display not a beauty except what appears ordinary of. And to draw her veil, a head covering over the bosom. And display not a beauty except in front of her father, her husband, her sons, and a big list of maram, the close relatives who she can't marry is given. There are basically six criteria for hijab given in the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. The first is the extent which differs between the man and the woman. For the man, it's from the navel to the knee. For the woman, the complete body should be covered. The only part that can be seen are the face and the hands up to the wrist. The remaining five criteria are the same for the man and the woman. The second is the clothes they wear, it should be loose. It should not be tight fitting. It should not reveal the figure. Third, the clothes should not be transparent. Fourth, it should not be so glamorous so that it attracts the opposite sex. Fifth, it should not resemble that of the opposite sex. And sixth, it should not resemble that of the unbelievers. These are basically the six criteria for hijab given in the Quran, the Sahih Hadith. And if you read the Bible, the Bible too has similar criteria of modesty. It's mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 22, verse number 5, that the woman shall not wear clothes that which pertinent to a man, and neither shall man wear the garments of the woman. Anyone who does so is an abomination to their God. That means wearing clothes of the opposite sex is even prohibited in the Bible. It's mentioned in the first Timothy, chapter number two, verse number nine, that the woman should be dressed up with modesty and shamefacedness and with sobriety. They should not have braided hair or should not wear gold or pearls or costly array. And it's mentioned in the first Corinthians, chapter number 11, verse number 5 to 6, that the woman that prophesies it or prays with a head uncovered, a head should be shaved off. The Bible in the first Corinthians, chapter number 11, verse number 5 to 6, says that the woman who does not cover a head when she is praying to the God, a head should be shaved off. Imagine even the Quran and the Sai Hadith is not as strict as the Bible, where the Bible says the head should be shaved off. So if Christian means a person who follows the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, I would like to tell you that we Muslims are more Christian than the Christians themselves. It is the Sunnah in Islam that we are circumcised. But the same message is given in the Bible. If you read the Bible, in the book of Acts, chapter number 7, verse number 8, it says that you have to be circumcised. It's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 7, verse number 22, that you have been given the covenant of circumcision. It's mentioned in the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 2, verse number 21, that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he was circumcised on the eighth day. So if Christian means a person who follows the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, we Muslims are more Christian than Christian themselves. So Muslim means a person who submits his will to Almighty God. And if Christian means a person who follows the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, then as I mentioned earlier, we Muslims are more Christian than Christian themselves. And as I mentioned earlier, it's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 5, verse number 30. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, Not my will, but the will of Almighty God. And anyone who says, Not my will, the will of Almighty God, that person is a Muslim. And Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was verily a very good practicing Muslim. I would like to end my talk by the quotation of the glorious Quran from Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 82, where it says that among the Heli Kitab, the closest to the Muslims are those people who say that we are Christians. Waakhra Dawan, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. L'infâme sur le beat, oublie pas les barbales Une balle ça part vite Demande à Malcolm X, j'ai plus faim comme Gandhi C'est la révolte, je vous le dis Plus j'avance et plus je grandis 
Je repense à qu'on t'a quitté derrière des chaînes Pour voir toute cette merde diffusée sur toutes les chaînes hey, Parole Julien Assange et aux années trop de Mandela Au Bob de Bob Marley sous un nuage de ganja L'histoire traverse les époques et j'espère laisser une trace Comme un tableau de Van Gogh tout claqué qui se vend des milliards Ils veulent notre place comme Rosa Parks, on est des terres comme Luther Toujours le point levé pour honorer la fierté de nos pères Parole de prodigy avec un coup de boule de Zinedine On fait trop honte à la France pour goûter ce millésime Tu peux demander à Moki ceux qui dénoncent les élites Depuis des piges et des piges comme ces fous, dis-moi qui suis-je Parole de Kennedy, on est tous contrôlés Liberté d'expression au shot, tu peux demander à Dieu donné C'est vraiment triste notre époque où les bavures reines Tiens mon master derrière les barreaux, c'est qui nous traîne J'entendrai jamais ma veste comme les frères avec leur Versace Donne du bif à des millionnaires en laissant leur pays se faire racheter C'est dramatique pour ceux qui donnent de leur vie Un combat du jour et nuit face aux malins et toutes ces combines Je suis un requin vicieux, un black dragon, un black panther Pas un guignol marketing, le black panther tard Marvel Ils veulent effacer notre histoire, à nous de faire notre propre recherche Il y a toujours de l'espoir, à toi de saisir la bonne perche mon frère Que meurt l'infâme